Hello, it is a pleasure for me to welcome you to this virtual realization of Prelude. This week, we're going to discuss Mahler and his sixth symphony, sometimes called the tragic one. My name, for those who are not yet familiar with me, is Carlos Andres Botero, and I'm the musical ambassador of this wonderful orchestra and the Houston Symphony. And the first thing we need to remember about Gustav Mahler is that he was a conductor, an orchestra conductor throughout the whole year, and only during the holidays over the summer he will take his family and retreat in the uh, Austrian Alps and rest from the uh, career of a conductor, but start his true passion composing. There is a little bit of a controversy in the order of the inner movements. This symphony has four movements. Traditionally, and I'm talking about the life of uh, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, they will take a fast movement and a last movement as the outer ones, and then a slow and a dance right before the finale. In the sense of, of what Mahler did with his sixth symphony, he decided originally to swap the order, therefore having after the first movement a dance, a scherzo, but even publish the, the, this version. So the first publication of the symphony actually has this order, but Mahler himself never per performed the piece in that order. So he switched his mind and even incurred an extra expense by asking his publisher to uh, attach a Fede Erratas, an um, error page, instructing every single conductor from then on to swap the order as it showed up in the first publication. Mahler himself always named the piece the sixth. That's it. But one of his students, Bruno Walter, he was his assistant uh, for many years, he decided that the interpretation of the piece required a new subtitle, and that subtitle he put it as the tragic. Yes, I agree, the piece seems to be going down into tragedy as every movement evolves, but that doesn't mean that we should change the title of the piece. Therefore, it will be few instances where orchestras will insist on the tragic connotation, or perhaps to aid the listening of the audiences. But now that we know this, the official title is just Symphony No. 6. Even though most of the movements are in, in the key of E minor, themselves the switch between the colors of major and minor. minor. For instance, the first movement, and this is quite a, a unique to this piece, it starts in A minor and ends in A major. If a composer was to do that, they will do it and wait for the A major up to the very end of the symphony. Mahler instead decides to do it at the first movement. Again, it goes against this interpretation of the symphony as tragic, because if you listen carefully, the first movement ends in so, sort of a victory, with the key of E major shining through the orchestra. All of this to say, Whenever you listen to Mahler, the joy and sadness, the melancholy and expression of laughter will coexist. They will be in the music at the same time, simultaneously. If you keep that in mind, I'm pretty sure the listening of the whole symphony will be successful. Whenever we want to analyze Symphony No. 6 by Gustav Mahler, we can think of it as an autobiographical. Gustav himself is telling us how he feels his life up to this moment has been happening and how he dreams his life becoming. Over-sensitive, over-expressive Mahler will always think that tragedy was inevitable and not only accept as it comes, but sometimes even expecting it. There is nothing to say that the symphony is only tragic, but it is important to remember that for Mahler, the end was always to look somehow gloomy. Now, when we return to our idea of the structure of the symphony, there are four movements, as we were saying. The first one, it is the one that is going to express the struggle that Mahler is at this moment of his life. Let's listen to the very beginning of the piece. It's an um, inevitable march, much of a... Uh, idea that Mahler continuously uses, but this is not a gloomy march, it, it is not also a war-like march. 
it is it is more um, expressing the constant flow of life and sometimes with nice colors sometimes with more uh, dark brooding textures but in general it is a constant pace that keeps going and it, no one can expect so let's listen to the first few measures of the symphony Chorale of the of the woodwinds. Then we find the string singing this uh, passionate theme. Alma Mahler claims in her diary that uh, Gustav told her this was her theme, and the whole first movement was to narrate their lives together. If we accept this interpretation and we take her at her word, we will now enjoy this Alma theme from every single time that it shows up. And if you pay close attention to it, it will be quite hard to forget. The year of composition is 1903, and he was just a few years uh, away from his own death. He didn't know it yet, but a year later, his uh, heart was uh, discovered that it had uh, an, an issue, and then it will ultimately mean his, his disease. Um, this moment, the one I'm narrating, it right in the middle of the movement, it seems to be a premonition. Mahler, as I, we were discussing earlier, thinks that life it, it cannot avoid tragedy and the tragedy is going to show up but he imagined the moment of tragedy as a moment of transcending and not of suffering so let's listen to that little interjection and then pay close attention because it even includes cowbells as if mother is trying to represent this regular sounds of the alps After almost 20 minutes of struggle, there is a victory and A major and the colors of victory uh, shine through the ending and the exciting ending of this movement. Now, discussing a little on the second movement, you will immediately realize that it comes in stark contrast with the previous one. It seems to be a little of a tranquility that befalls um, the soul of Mahler. And everything in this movement, he will aim to bring peace and certainty to our listening. There's just uh, these few seconds of the beginning of it because this melody it seems to try to soothe our wounds. Throughout the whole length of this andante, we will actually have this contrast, this moment of respite from what came before and what is about to show up. In a way, it's a way to express the, the stakes, it's a way to classify how much is at stake and how much we can lose if this battle is lost.
Now, going into the third movement, and here is when um, perhaps it shows a better explanation why, why this scherzo needs to be in third place in the movement um, chronology. It, according to Mahler, represents the playing of children outside the window where Mahler was composing. It is quite poignant when we remember that a year later, after this piece was finished, his older daughter had uh, passed away. His heart condition was diagnosed and ultimately take, took him to his death. And again, one year after this symphony was completed, he left the Vienna Opera um, rather in, in a negative manner, in, in, in conflict. So, if you want to talk about premonition, this discurso that starts so innocently always takes us to, how we say, a tragedy and its inevitability. Now we arrive to the last movement, movement number four. This finale certainly fits the, the nickname of tragic. But if we pay close attention, and it, it's actually a challenge because the length of it actually takes away our, our attention. This movement is so long, it comprises almost half of the total 80 minutes of length of the whole symphony. But if we pay close attention, we will realize that not until the very end, tragedy happens. A tragedy does strike, but constantly Mahler finds a way to keep fighting keep the fight alive. And in this regard, it just defeats the, the nickname of tragic because not until the very end you actually realize that you're gonna end. Perhaps that makes it even more bittersweet because you could win. Uh, throughout this whole movement, there are several instances where Mahler is building a climax that affirms victory. Um, unfortunately, what he felt was necessary was to express this defeat. At the same time, I do not think that there is a, another piece in, in his whole output that is so life-affirming, perhaps because of the creativity or because it instills in every one of the listeners a desire to keep that fight and not to let it down so that uh, Gustav's sacrifice could be expressed in, in a positive way in our own lives. And this takes me to that second interpretation. We can feel the whole symphony as an autobiography by Gustav Mahler or what he thought the future was going to imprint in his own life. But we can also understand the symphony as an expression of what he wants us to see. So it is that he wants himself to pass on the interpretation and we are the ones that carry it on. Perhaps because of that, the symphony is not so gut-wrenching as it could have been. But now discussing what the movement is about, let's listen a little bit of the start and you will immediately realize that this is angst reading uh, music. All through it's an all-out battle and only the fit, the most fit, will survive. In this fourth movement, there is an inclusion of a new instrument, one created exclusively for the piece and, um, as far as I am aware, has never been replicated because it is not a gimmick. It is an expression of the blows of fate. As you, by now, might um, imply or, or recognize that I'm implying the hammer, the big box, wooden box that uh, Mother asked to be created and a hammer that accompanies. Twice at the end of the movement, this hammer is going to blow over the sound of the orchestra right at the moments where Mahler is getting ready to build the climaxes. And because of this, it's so poignant in a message. Fate strikes right before we were going to claim victory. 
Originally, Mahler had three blows, but he felt that by doing the third one, he was actually tempting fate. If you want, as an exercise throughout the listening of the piece, try to find where it is that that third one should have strike or stricken, because it will give us a, a clue into what is the mind of Mahler. He wants us to participate. So as we were um, discussing, the blow of the hammer happens right before climax was going to be life affirming, and instead, instead transforming transforms the piece into the tragic ending that we were um, expecting for some minutes now. So let's listen to one of the instances where the hammer strikes. Thanks for watching. This was Carlos Andres Botero, musical ambassador of the Houston Symphony. Always remember to have a wonderful week. Thank you.